Information regarding the Open Meetings Act is posted on the east wall of this room on the south side of the door. Live web streaming will be available through the State Board of Education website, www.education.ne.gov slash state board. Board members, please remember to engage your microphones before speaking and turn them off when you are finished speaking. Um, please turn off personal cell phones. Thank you. The first item that we have on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of Just December? Make that motion. Second. So we have a motion by John Witzel, second by Pat McPherson. Any comments, questions, discussion? Hearing none. Denise, please call the roll. Maureen Nichols. Yes. Patricia Tim. Yes. Patrick McPherson. Yes. Molly O'Halloran. Yes. Lily Larson. Yes. John Witzel. Yes. Rachel Wise. Yes. Glenn Flint. Yes. Eight yes. We'll now move on to item three, approval of the agenda. Commissioner, are there any recommended changes for today's agenda? No recommended changes. I did think, I, oh, I saw Glenn had his hand up over oh, there. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Pat. Oh, well, Pat had, oh. <laughs> then I saw him. <laughs> uh, Madam President, I, I would move that we, uh, we have public comment prior to our um, prior to our recess. I don't think there's any reason to make these folks that come down here in, in this weather uh, wait any longer than necessary to make their public comments. Uh, do I second that then? Okay, so we have a motion and a second to make that change in the agenda. <clears throat> okay. All right, um, is there any discussion on making the change between, let's just verify the uh, public comment section, um, which would be item. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In other um, words, 4.1 4. 4. Yes. would become. Move it to. Mm -hmm. just move it up, yeah. yeah. Any questions, comments? Okay, hearing none. Uh, it would be moved to um, basically before the elections. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily before the election, just before the recess was my, my motion. Okay, the motion is before the recess. So it would be after the elections. Uh, okay, so before the recess and after the elections. Any other comments, discussion? Yes, Glenn. Okay. If there is no other discussion, Denise, please call the roll. Rachel Wise. Yes. Glenn Flint. Yes. Lily Larson. Yes. <clears throat> Patrick McPherson. Yes. Maureen Nichols. Yes. John Witzel. Yes. Molly O'Halloran. Yes. Patricia Tim. Yes. Eight yes. All right. The motion carries, so we'll make that, that change. <clears throat> I still mean just give a little bit of overview because what I wanted to do is actually just talk about the election process o overview and then we'll get in the script which will also walk us through the the election process but I <clears throat> will go through a process where uh, um, Rachel is president and will ask for me to actually serve as the to run the election process right and so you'll have an opportunity to nominate then we'll do private ballots uh, we'll do president first and then and then the vice president position and we'll kind of walk through that process and, we'll, and be able to go through there so yeah Patrick okay. uh, madam president uh, the state law calls for a, a roll call vote on elections I know that this board has in the past used a ballot it is not part of any policy that I can find in the uh, for the board and I would ask that absent a, uh, a, a motion to have a ballot election, that we have an open uh, roll call vote on nominations for the president and vice president. And, and well, that was a motion, I don't think. That was a motion, was, yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll second that. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor and a second to have a roll call vote as opposed to ballot for the election. Uh, is there any discussion or comments, including any from legal counsel? I would just add that uh, the Open Meetings Act permits, but does not require public bodies to elect leadership by secret ballot. 
just discussion is you know just Let's for the point of information mm -hmm. uh, our, our attorney is correct on that but I am just saying that absent any kind of you know if this if this vote fails and somebody wants to to uh, introduce a motion to have a uh, ballot election that would be appropriate otherwise I believe it's appropriate to you know to deal with this motion either vote it up or vote it down uh, Glenn I, I always uh, um, pick on my um, friends down at the unicameral because they have secret ballots for their leadership and I think we should be open and, and transparent so that we have accountability for our elections any other really uh, a question um, what has occurred <coughs> for the past <coughs> How many years back has it always been in this format, as far as you know, your senior? <laughs> uh, to the best of my recollection, um, state board officer elections have always been conducted by secret ballot. I don't remember an instance of roll call, but again, it, it's certainly uh, permissible. Any other discussion? <clears throat> Comments? Hearing none, then we will uh, roll call with the motion. Denise? Lily Larson? No. Glenn Flint? Yes. Rachel Wise? Yes. John Witzel? Yes. Molly O'Halloran? Yes. Patricia Tim? <coughs> yes. Maureen Nichols? No. Patrick McPherson? Yes. Six yes, two no. All right, Commissioner, <laughs> are there any other comments and suggestions that you wanted to make regarding today's well, agenda? Well, with that motion passing, that means we're going to elect, elect President and Vice President by roll call vote. So, <laughs> right, so we'll go through our process. I'm going to confer a little bit and make sure that I have the order of things properly done. So, I'll do that quickly, and then that would be. I think our next order of business so um, yes yeah, so we can go ahead and do the <coughs> motion to approve today's agenda yeah. and then um, look at the procedures yeah. that maybe are modified is there a motion to approve the agenda as amended and discussed so moved second so we have a motion in a second <coughs> to approve the uh, uh, agenda as amended yeah. any questions discussion Hearing none, Denise, please call the roll. Rachel Wise? Yes. <clears throat> Lily Larson? Yes. Glenn Flynn? Yes. John Witzel? Yes. Patricia Tim? Yes. Molly O'Halloran? Yes. Patrick McPherson? Yes. Maureen Nichols? Yes. <coughs> Eight yes. All right. I think we just modify yeah. the next step. Yeah. Um, so the issue is whether or not you want me to preside. You need a motion yes, for that. Still, yeah. So yeah. that would. I think, think we think still, still need to do that. To I think it's appropriate. Yeah. That's still the um, past practice. Um, so as we're having this conversation, we're modifying kind of the next step uh, a little bit. And so, in the next step, in the past practices, there's been a four-part motion that talks about the process uh, at that point of how we would do. Um, the the voting we've made that change in a change with how we'll do the voting today but there still needs to be a motion that um, uh, basically um, has the commissioner um, stand in uh, point the commissioner to stand in in his role as board secretary to facilitate the process of elections uh, that's been one of the past practices that we have the differences typically we also give direction around um, the ballot process um, and so in this case the difference would be that we would be making a motion for the commissioner as secretary of the board to preside over the nomination election process um, and then in doing so um, we'll move that process then into a roll call vote process so I think that's the only modification from our 
just practice. Is, is there you're gonna, is that a motion? We need a motion that would be the for the commissioner to preside um, as secretary of the board to preside over the nomination election process. So moved. Second. So we have an motion and a second. Comment. For the commissioner. Discussion? Yes. Uh, under Robert's rules, I don't believe that that is necessary. I believe that you can continue to run the mm -hmm. meeting. And that just point of information, we don't necessarily have to have the secretary do this. Any other comments, questions? So we have a motion and a second to um, have the um, commissioner serve in his role to preside over the nomination election process. Denise, do you want to call for the roll, please? Patricia Tim? Yes. Patrick McPherson? No. Maureen Nichols? Yes. Molly O'Halloran? Yes. John Witzel? Yes. Lily Larson? Yes. Glenn Flint? Yes. Rachel Wise? Yes. Seven yes, one no. as I fly here so <laughs> thanks um, so uh, with this role so what we will do is uh, we'll go through a process where we will keep the same order we'll go president first get that to resolution and then move to vice president and get that to resolution Does that makes sense um, so what I'll do I'll actually start by actually opening it up for nominations by the way the uh, the this will be for a one-year term as well so it'll be simply for the remainder of this because by statute we have to reorganize every two years after the election as well so Margaret might have some yeah, you'll just start up there yeah okay so nominations are now open for president of the State Board of Education according to Robert's rules of order no seconds are required for nominations a member may nominate himself or herself votes may be cast for any current member of the State Board even if they're not nominated I nominate Rachel Wise for president. Are there any other nominations? So with that, I believe that Mr. Chairman saying that there are Mr. Er, Secretary saying that there are no other nominations. I um, move that nominations be closed and a unanimous vote be cast for Rachel Wise for president. So with that, I believe we'll need a roll call. We're required. Vote, right? yeah, we'll you need a second. Yeah. A second. A second. Yeah. All right. So there's a motion and a second to elect Rachel Wise as president of the board. And I'll wait for Denise when she's ready. I'll say roll call, <laughs> Denise. <laughs> I have to get out of my rut. Um, so that was moved by Patrick McPherson. I did not hear who seconded. I did. Pat, Pat did. Pat did. Pat did this no, one. John. It was. Oh. John, 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 oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Ready? What are we voting on? To close nominations. Close nominations. Close nominations. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So but actually, so I want to double check that because actually, Pat Patrick made the motion to close nominations with the unanimous with a unanimous, unanimous vote. vote. But we need a roll call. Vote. But we need a roll call. Yeah. 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 So it, it, we're actually voting on the closing nominations and declaring Rachel president of the board. Right. Okay, that's what I have. Does that make okay. sense? Yep. So. Rachel Wise? Yes. Glenn Flint? Yes. Lily Larson? Yes. John Witzel? Yes. Molly O'Halloran? Yes. Patricia mm -hmm. Tim? Yes. Maureen Nichols? Yes. Patrick McPherson? Yes. Eight yes. I felt like you were railroaded, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so well, <laughs> I guess I get to continue to preside, as uncomfortable as that is. The the uh, 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 so the next round we'll do the very same thing for the vice president of the board, and so I, I will open the floor for nominations for vice president. I nominate Lily Larson as vice president. Second. So, so nomination and a second. Any other nominations? I'll nominate Molly O'Halloran. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we're just taking I them. I thought I heard a second, but we don't need. Seconds. You don't need we a don't second. We don't need a second. Okay. With it. 
So we have two nominations so far for vice president. Okay, and the second one was who nominated Molly? Glenn did. Glenn. Okay. <coughs> so is there, um, I don't see any other nominations. Is there a motion to cease nominations? I'll make that motion. Second. <coughs> Pat. I, I can guarantee Pat made the second. I just, well, Pat McPherson, I think, would yeah. rang in quicker there. This format is not following. <laughs> so the nominations are not voted on. Just the the ceasing changes. nomination, yeah, that's exactly it. John and seconded by Pat McPherson right, thank you. to close nominations. Okay. Patricia Tim. Yes. Maureen Nichols. Yes. Patrick McPherson. Yes. Rachel Wise. Yes. Glenn Flint. Yes. Lily Larson. Yes. Uh, John Witzel. Yes. Molly O'Holloran. Yes. Eight yes. So as I as I understand it, somebody would have to, I don't know if we do a vote. Um, you would need a motion, motion to elect. We need a motion to elect individual. someone, yes. I would move that we elect uh, Lily Larson as vice president. Morning. I second, mm -hmm. I second that. Discussion. Any discussion? I, I think Lily's a fine vice president. I just thought Molly uh, balances the state. We have somebody from the western part of the state then as vice president and somebody from the eastern part as the president. That was my logic. Any other discussion? All right, roll call vote. John Witzel? Yes. Molly O'Halloran? No. Patricia Tim? Yes. Maureen Nichols? Figure out what I was voting on. Oh, yes. Patrick McPherson? No. Rachel Wise? Yes. Glenn Flint? No. Lily Larson? Yes. And did I get everybody? Did you miss John? Did I, I thought I started with John. John Witzel. Yeah, okay. Okay. Five yes, three no. Okay. So motion carries. So we've elected Lily now as vice president, and I feel so much better about to turn all this stuff back over to the president, <laughs> vice president. <laughs> but uh, thank you, thank you, everyone, for taking that, and uh, we got through it. I guess is how I would put that. So thanks. Thank you, uh, Commissioner, and thank you all. Um, um, as we move on into this next year. It certainly is an honor and a privilege to have served you as president and to continue to do so in this next next year. So thank you very much. So next we'll move to public comment period. We have two requests, <clears throat> special requests for public comment and those special requests um, have been granted for 10 minutes. The first request was from Henry Burke. So good morning, Mr. Burke. Madam President, yep. uh, Excuse me. are you not going to go to 3.2 before you do this? Oops, what did I miss? Discuss board committee tr membership? Um, certainly. I think that's part of the agenda. Actually, thank you. Um, one second. Uh, with the board committee membership, what we'll be doing is uh, taking input from all of you um, on what committees will be sending out an email on what committee structure there'll be some different committee structure we'll visit uh, about that but with the strategic planning we'll probably have some new committees that will be coming forward and then we'll put on the agenda for our January meeting uh, to discuss and finalize committee assignments at that point so I will be sending out after visiting with the Commissioner information on on what committee structure it looks like this year um, it looks like probably added committee structure, at least added for strategic planning committee. Send out uh, information to all of you on what areas of committees you're interested in, uh, and then we will uh, go from there. Lily and I uh, will talk about 
what your interests are so you can let either of us know and we'll uh, put that together for the January 25th meeting. Really? Um, I'd like to, something that I'm familiar with doing in the past is uh, actually people submitting a list of the committees and preferences and why uh, if you feel comfortable doing that because then it's clear sometimes when you just have a general discussion maybe it's not as clear so that would be my recommendation mm -hmm. is uh, uh, mm -hmm. a specific request for a committee but you don't have to do it either it's not in required but I know it helps me Okay. Any other question or comment? Thank you, Pat, for bringing that up. Okay, if not, now we're back to public comment period. Um, and Mr. Burke, good morning. Good morning. You will have 10 minutes. My name is Henry Burke. I would like to discuss the Nebraska standards and the ESSA bill. On December 3rd, a Nebraska Department of Education official indicated in a letter to me that the NDE would develop standards for the following areas. English language arts, math, science, social studies, fine arts, physical education, health education, world languages, health sciences, information technology, computer science, education and training, family and com consumer sciences, agriculture, food and natural resources, skilled and technical sciences, business, marketing and management, law and public safety, and arts, AV technology, and communication. Why is the Nebraska Department of Education planning to expand the number of content areas covered by the Nebraska standards from five to 18? For many years, the NDE and the State Board of Education had education standards for English, math, science, and social studies. Nebraska statute 7960.01 requires standards for the four basic subjects, English, Mathematics, Science, and Social Studies. When the NDE cannot write good type one standards for the four basic subjects, why would the department choose to expand the list to 18 areas? It does not make sense. I'm quite concerned about two content areas, health education and health sciences. Is the NDE planning to develop comprehensive sex education standards? The public has a right to know. Let's shift gears and move into the new education bill. What do you know about the ESSA bill? On December 10th, 2015, Obama signed into law the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA. Will this education measure be good for America and good for Nebraska. Education expert Donna Garner wrote an excellent article about the clueless congressman who passed the ESSA bill. She listed some of the clues why this law is bad for America. Here is the first clue. A top U.S. Department of Education official stated that, and this is a quote, this bill will embed college and career ready standards, or as we know, Common Core. They do not expect any states to get away from the standards. The DOE is giddy with excitement at the impending passage of ESSA. This session was the day before the vote. This is the second clue that ESSA is bad for America. Obama, Nancy Pelosi, Harry Reid, and Arne Duncan promoted the bill. And the measure was supported by 37 of our nation's most left-wing organizations. Here's the third clue. The Common Core copyright owners supported the bill. When the National Governors Association and the Council of Chief State School Officers supported the measure, what does that tell you? The fourth clue comes from the way elected leaders rushed it through Congress. ESSA totals 1,061 pages, but congressmen had only two days to read and vote on the measure. The fifth clue, that the law is bad for America is more deception. The ESSA proponents decided to fool everyone by saying that the bill would give states control over standards. Jane Robbins gives us more insight into the ESSA measure. In a recent article, Jane Robbins explained, 
the state plan, which includes the state standards, must be coordinated with 11 different federal statutes. If the state standards must be coordinated for all these, that means the standards must be either Common Core or something like Common Core. The new bill also impacts higher education. So, since ESSA also requires that all students be held to these standards, states will obviously choose the community college standards. Guess what standards are already out there that are designed to prepare students for community college? You guessed it, Common Core. Because some of you are big on preschool education, you might be interested in this next part. The new education measure greatly expands preschools. ESSA codifies a $250 million preschool program in law and places it at the Health and Human Services Department, HHS. The law's preschool expansion is in addition to the 45 existing pre-K programs, which cost taxpayers $20 billion annually. For 50 years, HHS has managed the failed Head Start program with very poor results. Head Start is a miserable failure. According to HHS's own empirical evaluation, Head Start has had no impact on participating children's cognitive abilities, social-emotional well-being, or their parents' parenting practices. A study published in 2012 by the Obama administration's HHS found that students who participated in the Head Start preschool program actually fared worse on several levels than students who did not. The study concluded that even when some positive effects of participation in Head Start are found in preschool age children, those effects disappear once children enter early elementary school. When Head Start has had such poor results, why would we want to expand it? The education measure was written behind closed doors. Perhaps the most galling aspect of ESSA's progression is the secretive, underhanded manner in which the bill was advanced. ESSA was written by unknown parties working behind closed doors with no notice to the public and re was released only two days before the vote. What about the promised local control in the new bill? On many occasions, I've urged this board to adopt de and develop specific type one standards. Your excuse invariably for not doing so is that you don't want to interfere with local control. Well, let's think about this ESEA rewrite. Do you really think that the pro common core authors of this legislation would restore state and local autonomy, thereby unraveling everything that they have accomplished under Obama and Duncan? It's purely delusional. What about the federal testing requirements? ESSA maintains the federally dictated testing aimed more at measuring students' attitudes and dispositions than assessing students' academic knowledge. ESSA even reaches into private schools. An entire section of the law, beginning on page 833, is titled Participation by Private School Children and Teachers. Maybe some of you are doubting what I'm saying. Every single statement comes from reliable sources. I urge you to read the report that I sent you earlier this week and verify the information for yourself. Education Secretary Arne Duncan made some very re revealing statements about ESSA in a recent article. Arne Duncan said, exact quote, I'm stunned at how much better it ended up than either the House or Senate bill going into conference. I had a Democratic congressman say to me that it's a miracle. He's literally never seen anything like it. Arne Duncan continued, if you look at the substance of what is there, embedded in the law are the values that we've promoted and proposed forever. The core of our agenda from day one, that's all in there. Early childhood, high standards, common core, not turning a blind eye when everything, are, when everything is bad. For the first time in our nation's history, that's the letter of the law. If those bold statements were not enough, Secretary Duncan took a victory lap in saying, the final thing is we have every ability to implement, to regulate the law, 
It's just a Washington typical storyline. And candidly, our lawyers are much better than many of the folks who wrote this bill. And we have every ability to implement. That's all I've ever wanted. Close the, close the quote. In conclusion, the Nebraska Department of Education is quite foolish to expand the number of standards from 5 to 18. The NDE should stay away from sex education standards. The new ESSA law will be very bad for America and for Nebraska. Get ready for even more federal control under the new education law. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Next, we have a request um, uh, to speak. Uh, we have Sherry Rickard, who's been granted a request for 10 minutes as well. Good morning, Mrs. Rickard. You have 10 minutes. Thank you, and thank you again for giving me this time. My name is Sherry Rickert, and I'm the Policy Director General Counsel for the Nebraska Catholic Conference, which, as you know, represents the mutual interests and concerns of the Catholic bishops serving the Archdiocese of Omaha and the Diocese of Lincoln and Grand Island. We also monitor issues that impact children who attend our Catholic schools and do our best to represent the interests of those children and their parents in public policy discussions related to education. Thank you once again for giving me the opportunity to speak with you about one such issue, the textbook loan program. I regret that since I gave comments on the same issue at your meeting in December, the conference has not received any communication indicating even a willingness to address the outdated Rule 4. Therefore, the conference today is submitting to you a petition for a rules change pursuant to Title 92 of the Nebraska Administrative Code, Chapter 63, Rule 63, on behalf of children who are the intended beneficiaries of the textbook loan program. As you will see from the attachment to the petition, we are proposing an amendment of the definition of textbook in Title 92 of the NAC, Chapter 4, that would satisfy the federal and state constitutional requirements and conform to the wording and legislative intent of the Nebraska Revised Statute, Section 79-734, Paragraph 2. While addressing the current shortcomings of Rule 4, this amendment also would provide the flexibility necessary to keep pace with future developments in educational resources for individual students. As stated in the petition, an amendment is needed for the following reasons. Since Rule 4 was last amended in 2008, the major publishers of educational materials have been transitioning from the traditional hardbound textbook to other formats, including electronic media and, tech and work text issued as multi-year subscriptions. Public school children are being provided with the updated educational materials as textbooks under Section 79734.2 but the Nebraska Department of Education is interpreting the word textbook differently for purposes of providing educational materials to private school children under the same provision, thereby denying private school children equitable access to these educational resources. Pursuant to Section 79-734-2, private school children can access only those quote-unquote textbooks designated for use in the public schools of the school district in which the child resides or the school district in which the private school the child attends is located. Since the Nebraska Department of Education is interpreting Rule 4 as excluding the new educational materials being provided to those pr public school children, the educational materials and the forms of such materials available to private school children are becoming increasingly limited under the program. Repeated attempts by the Nebraska Catholic Conference to resolve this issue on behalf of private school children through informal discussions with the Nebraska Department of Education and the leadership of the State Board of Education have been unsuccessful. In order to utilize the limited amount of funding specifically appropriated by the legislature for textbooks for private school children, 
The only state assistance received by Nebraska's taxpayers to, who choose to send their children to private school, I might note, it is necessary to update Rule 4 to accurately reflect the plain wording and the legislative intent behind 79-734-2 as a matter of urgency. In recognition of the rapidly evolving forms of educational materials being issued by publishers and provided, by in, and provided to individual public school students pursuant to 79-734-2, Rule 4 should be amended in the manner that best accommodates these future developments while respecting the wording and the legislative intent of 79-734-2. As you probably know, Rule 63 requires the Board to respond to this petition within 60 days, either by adopting the rule change, initiating rulemaking proceedings, or denying the petition in writing with a statement of the reasons for the denial. The Nebraska Catholic Conference remains available to discuss this amendment with the Board and the Department of Education. We also will be informing the parents of children in our Catholic schools, as well as other private schools that may have students who benefit from the textbook loan program, about the challenge face facing the program, the efforts we have made to try to address it, and that a petition for a rules change is pending before the Board of Education. I thank you once again for your time and attention, and we look forward to receiving the Board's response to this petition. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Mrs. Rickard. We'll now move into our other public comment period, and I believe we have two requests. Um, the first of those requests is Deb Andrews. Good morning, Mrs. Andrews. You will be given five minutes. Thank you. My name is Deb Andrews. I'm concerned about the level of reading and math proficiency of Nebraska students. The NAEP scores that just came out in November reflect that just 38% of Nebraska children, students, are proficient in reading and math. That's a concern. We have things that are changing in our environment and the world. There's a study that just came out from the University of Nebraska Lincoln I'd like to share. The Ogallala Aquifer now contains concentrations of uranium that are 89 times the EPA standard and concentrations of nitrates that are 189 times the EPA standard. That's a concern. The nitrate levels in the ground are so high that it's caused reactions with a natural occurring uranium that makes it soluble and it enters the groundwater. That affects crops. We're an agricultural state. Crops can accumulate uranium when irrigated by water containing high levels. We need children in this state that can read, write, and do math more than ever before. There's a new book out on Margaret Thatcher, and this was a revelation. In 1984, the English coal miners that were nationalized went on strike against the government. Their union boss, their public union boss, received payments from Libya, who also had made payments to the terrorists in Ireland. That public union boss also received $1.4 million from the Soviet Union. Nebraska students are denied the opportunity for school choice. We don't have charter schools. We don't have vouchers. Parents are not able to receive education dollars. Why is that after decades of learning failure? The majority of members on this board, school boards, the education committee and the legislature are all supported by the union for campaign funding or endorsement. Is there a connection? Why do we not have choice? Now is the time. I went to a dyslexia conference this fall and learned that preschool teachers are unfamiliar with phonics. Preschool is expanding. If the preschool teachers are unfamiliar with phonics, those children will be crippled for reading by the time they get to kindergarten. If you have a sense of decency on this board, I urge you to contact your senators and promote charter schools, Nebraska academic savings accounts, and Senator Chris Bill 26. 
that would provide tax credits, money for children to attend better learning options. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Andrews. Next, we have Tom Nesbitt. Good morning. Some stuff I'd like to pass out to everybody. All right. And you? You know, this is for your reading and drawing, obviously, <laughs> at a different time. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone gets one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I help you pass it on? About 10. For the commissioner and for Brian as well. We'll take it that one. Okay. Well, thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here. I appreciate it uh, very much. Uh, I know that I have five minutes, and uh, I'll make sure I don't go over five minutes, but uh, I give these presentations uh, to school boards all across the state of Nebraska, and it usually takes about 20 minutes at the minimum uh, to be able to get the process through. What I've uh, given you is the information on the company, School Security Services, which is part of Nesbitt & Associates. Uh, my career was in public safety. I spent over 30 years in public safety. I was blessed to be in the State Patrol for 28 years here in Nebraska. In the last six years of my career, I was a Colonel Superintendent, uh, the head of the patrol, before I retired in 05. One of the things that I learned uh, uh, when I started this company is uh, being a public employee my whole life, uh, I really had the desire and need to continue to help the public. And children are very important to me. And when I was a colonel, uh, after 9-11, after Columbine, I saw there was a need in schools that we needed to do some things because they were very chaotic in incidents of tornadoes or whatever the case may be. I started to send troopers to those schools and I learned a lot. After I retired, I thought, we got to carry this on. We got to do more for the schools. So as you can see in that information that I have, I've written a safety plan that uh, took me over a year to write. It's very detailed. It's everywhere from a shooter intruder situation to out west I dealt with with a rabid skunk that got in a school oh, and no one knew how to handle that situation. And uh, I mean, it's very detailed in what to do. And uh, and I, uh, I, I want to applaud Jolene Palmer. Uh, Jolene worked with me when she was uh, in the patrol as a DARE uh, coordinator, uh, very capable. And, and did a very good job. The committee was unbelievable, having that many people a uh, part of that committee. And uh, they put together a lot of good things that, uh, that I think that will help overall. Um, I will say that uh, I would like to have been part of that committee, and I'll tell you why, because I've been doing this for six years, and I know a lot that's gone through uh, and involved with this. As you can see, my client list from education, there's a tremendous amount of schools that my product is in in your districts. And uh, we've been very successful in, in what we've tried to accomplish. The one thing that, that I can say is you can put all the information that you want in front of people. And if they don't take it seriously and don't do the training, it's worthless. It will not work, I'm telling you. This is a safety plan. As you can see, it's rather thick, a lot. So then something happens and, and the superintendent needs to know how to respond. Here are all the different things that are in this and how to respond, to flip to the page and go. Because I can tell you from being a cop for as many years as I, wa I was, when adrenaline starts to flow, you forget things. And if you don't cover everything that's necessary, then you forget. This is for a staff. And you have a copy of this in there as well as what the things are. So each. Everyone has a flip chart in how to respond to these situations. My products are in public schools, private schools, and in colleges here in the state of Nebraska. My company has evolved from when I started it in 07 to an international security consulting company. I actually have jobs overseas in Belgium, Finland, Singapore, and other places. I mean, and, and I only say that because I'm not just somebody off the street that's coming in here trying to tell you something that, that needs to be done here. I really have this in my heart, and, and I'm telling you that this is very important. And of course, being in the business, you know, the last thing I want is the Department of Education to come out and say, you know what, Nesbitt, your stuff doesn't meet our, meet our, our things that we want in the schools. 
And now I've got a hundred and some schools that have invested in this product and they can't utilize it. That's not a good deal, folks. I'm telling you, it, it, that would be a bad situation if that would take place. The one thing that, that I am concerned, I love you guys, I'm going to tell you right now, is uh, uh, we train in a, in a process of, it's called run, hide, and fight. And you can go on the Department of Homeland Security. They have it on there. The FBI have it on there as well. I'm not saying kindergartens fight. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm telling you, when an intruder comes into school, he's about seven or eight minutes, and he or she are going to try to do as much damage as they can. And if they get in a room, you've got to figure out how to fight this person the best you can to try to save these children. And that's part of it. And, and it, we need to think about that and utilize it. And I see I got nine seconds left, so I'm going to hurry up here. So the, the end result is this, is that I would be happy to talk to anybody from the Department of Education to be part of this. I think I have, my company has a lot that we can offer to help. I'm not saying anything degrading about this committee because they did a great job. I know I'm done. So thank, thank you very you. much. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Nisbet. Um, at this time, I do not have any other requests. Uh, for public comments, so we will take a break. Um, try to be back by 10. <laughs> Long break. <laughs> Lots of time. <clears throat>
See, I did that too. I was in February. I didn't read any of that stuff. Okay, the State Board will reconvene uh, and we are going to uh, change the order of the agenda just a little bit. We're going to be moving to item 9, special presentations, and first thing I'd like to do is actually uh, uh, not so much a presentation as much as a recognition, uh, and I'd like to read this resolution. Uh, the Nebraska State Board of Education Resolution Recognition of the Retirement of Beth Werda. Whereas Beth Werda has contributed to the quality of special education services provided by Nebraska public and non-public schools to all Nebraska children with disabilities during her 32-year tenure oh, wow. as a Nebraska Department of Education employee, right, whereas Beth Werda has provided guidance and leadership to the Nebraska Department of Education, Nebraska schools, the Special Education Advisory Council, the Federal Office of Special Education Programs, and the National Association of State Directors of Special Education, most recently as the Administrator of the Office of Special Education, whereas Beth Werda was dedicated to the education of students with disabilities and provided high quality training, always delivered with accuracy and a special touch of humor yes. to the Nebraska Association <laughs> of Special Education Supervisors, Teachers, School Administrators, and Parents in understanding the intent and expectations of the state and federal laws, whereas Beth Werda received the 1994 Nebraska Department of Education Employee of the Year and the 2014 Dr. Glenn I. Latham Excellence Award for Outstanding Leadership by the Technical Assistance for Excellence in Special Education, whereas Beth Werda retired on November 30th, 2015, <clears throat> leaving a legacy of support for Nebraska children ages birth to 21, their parents, teachers, schools, many colleagues. Uh, therefore, it be resolved that the Nebraska State Board of Education recognizes Beth Werda's contributions and service to the Nebraska public and non-public schools on behalf of generations of Nebraska children um, with disabilities and that the Nebraska State Board of Education greatly appreciates the assistance Beth Werda has provided to the board in, in her tireless dedication to Nebraska children, particularly children with disabilities, on behalf of the State Board of Education. Uh, congratulations. So. say my job rocked I loved my job <laughs> loved working here I think you guys set a great tone for the whole department everyone kind of moves in the same direction so thanks to you for that thanks to Gary for his leadership and guidance and thanks to the special education staff they are awesome <laughs> <laughs> yeah. thank, you. thank you Beth thank you so much and I, I just have to add a footnote. I have had the pleasure of working in the past with Beth when I was a special educator many, many years ago. So it's congratulations. And it, was a pleasure. it was a pleasure. And I'm kind of like the bad penny. I do not go away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. Good thing. <laughs> and she got away before I really got to say goodbye to yes. her. So. <laughs> thanks, Beth. <laughs> Beth, I think everybody wants to shake your hands up. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I know. It's like we're getting these requests, so they're all. Thank you. It's just beginning. Thank you. I'm going to miss you. We have two long years. We do. We do. One of us here. Yeah, I'll call you. We're very young. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Thank you. Thank you. I aspire to retire. Thank you. Next, we'll continue with item nine, and item nine is special presentations and discussions, and 
We have been having some communication with Jeff Cole um, from Nebraska Children Family Foundation off and on for about three months to uh, have a time for a special presentation. Uh, I believe his plans were for a short <laughs> presentation, but also we have the opportunity to certainly ask questions and have a discussion. Uh, Jeff is here to talk a little bit about the work that he's involved with around the expanded learning opportunity programs. So welcome, Jeff. Great. Well, Thanks thank you very for much for here. the opportunity. Again, my name is Jeff Cole. I'm with Nebraska Children and Families Foundation. And uh, <coughs> if I can get technology to cooperate, I've got a, a presentation that I'd like to use. And I'll, I'll jump around. There we go. Uh, from it a little bit. Uh, are you getting a feed now? Is that is that how it works? I'm not sure exactly. There we go. There, there we, we go. go. Okay. Um, just to tell you a little bit about who I am and what I do. Again, Jeff Cole, I'm network lead for Beyond School Bells. That's a program of Nebraska Children and Families Foundation where our work really uh, revolves around building community to support well-being of all Nebraska youth. And Beyond School Bells is really focused on expanded learning opportunities, which uh, this board passed a st policy statement in 2013 really defining that work and identifying the contribution that it makes to the education of every Nebraska youth. So, very excited to talk to you today about the opportunity that we really feel like AQUEST creates to help enhance the work of expanded learning opportunities and again the support for all Nebraska youth. But before I do that I just want to uh, again uh, take a little time to commend the board for the work that you've done. Uh, when I look and talk to my colleagues on a national level about the work that's going on in Nebraska, I'm always very thankful uh, that I reside in Nebraska and have chosen to stay in Nebraska. And one of the real reasons I've done so is the quality of public schools. I have a daughter that's gone through Lincoln Public Schools, gone to Title I schools throughout elementary, middle, and high school, has a fantastic world-class education. And that doesn't just happen by accident. It happens because of good policy making at the state level, great leadership like we just saw recognized here, and uh, day in, day out, hard work in schools. And I'm very thankful for that and uh, really commend you guys for not following uh, fad reforms that really aren't proven uh, to make an impact on day-to-day -day achievement in, in every Nebraska youth's education, but also not kind of following lockstep with some of the federal reforms that the government tends to push down that look great from Washington, may look really good in, in L.A., but don't really work well in Nebraska. So I really appreciate your independent streak and what you've done over the years to continue to build what I feel like is one of the best education systems in the country. And uh, my, my comments will kind of build on that a little bit um, to uh, kind of talk about the opportunity that we see emerging around um, AQUEST. Um, we really feel like at Nebraska Children that education is a community responsibility. It requires the participation of a wide range of participants, parents, community members, civic organizations, and maybe that's why we do really uh, do so well in Nebraska is that we have a lot of engaged participation across the community. We don't just isolate education in schools, but we really see it as a community responsibility. However, we're not naive. We understand that schools are the bedrock of our educational infrastructure. And again, so blessed to live in Nebraska. I'm a, I, I call myself a refugee from Texas and uh, love the system of education we have in Nebraska and would not trade that for, for anything. Um, but I do, in, in kind of contrast to some of the uh, uh, previous speakers, let me see if this is going to go forward. There we go. I think. Hmm. I'll figure out how to get this working. Um, but in contrast to some of the other speakers, I really do feel like um, that uh, the passage of the Every Student Success Act and the repeal of the No Child Left Beyond Act is a great development in education policy. I think for years we've been struggling how to overcome some of the handcuffs that No Child uh, Left Behind put on states. And I think with the Every Student Success Act, rightfully control of state education policy will be given back to states in a much larger measure than has been the case under No Child Left Behind. There have been benefits of No Child Left Behind, but I, I really believe that with the Every Student Success Act, we're in a much better position to continue our trend in Nebraska. And you guys, I think, should feel validated about the work you've done to create AQUEST 
and a process that looks at Nebraska specific determinants for quality. And when we look at AQUEST, we see an invitation uh, to participate in a much more comprehensive way to support the high quality education that's available for every Nebraska youth. Specifically, looking at the six tenets of AQUEST, we see a myriad of opportunities for community organizations to get involved across all six tenants, starting with positive partnerships and relationships. We think there are huge opportunities, and there must be huge opportunities for community residents to help build those positive partnerships and relationships so that students see themselves as part of the larger community that they will become taxpayers and citizens of. Transitions, we think there are huge opportunities for expanded learning opportunities, meaning high quality after school and summer programs to really support those critical transitions, especially the transition between the end of the school year and those, uh, those dog days of summer when we all know that so much learning goes, uh, uh, is, is erased. We also feel there's a huge opportunity for out of school time programs to be that transition between the end of the school day and that period in Nebraska when parents are working, they're not at home. And so how do we provide that, that transition between the high quality instruction and support kids get during the school day and that transition period before their parents or uh, their adult caregivers come home? Educational opportunities and access, clearly expanded learning opportunities can provide those engaging hands-on experiences that all kids need to learn to, uh, need to have to be successful and to kind of make the, the learning that takes place during the school day even more relevant. College and career ready, we think there are untapped opportunities that we're excited about exploring that can help position expanded learning opportunity programs to be that on-ramp to get young people in Nebraska communities thinking about the, uh, the jobs that are going to be there for them in the future. So we think there's huge opportunities there, assessment, educator investment uh, effectiveness across the board. When we look at AQUEST, we see this board and, and the uh, state education system saying, we want your involvement. And we, you know, I think oftentimes we kind of overlook that, uh, but it's really critical for us to see this kind of a, a aggressive kind of invitation laying out there for our, our participation. Why do we think it's so important? Uh, for us, it's really all about time. Even when young people are in their critical uh, school going years, research says that they only spend 18.5% of their waking hours in a formal classroom environment. Yet that's where we have traditionally as a society and through No Child Left Behind had kind of focused on, that's where everything's gonna change. We really feel like that 81.5% of a young person's time spent sat outside of the school day is critically important. And research also pulls, uh, kind, of, kind of builds this out. By the time young people enter middle school, there's already a 6,000 hour learning gap between low income kids and middle income kids. And specifically, the, the bulk of that is in after school, extracurricular and summer learning activities. Huge investments are being made by more fluent parents in their kids' out of school time learning. And, and we think that's fantastic. We think that parents should be involved. We think communities should be involved. But the disparities, I think, are becoming alar alarmingly large. This graph shows that uh, in um, 2008 dollars, the gap between uh, a top income quartile parents' investment in their children's extracurriculars and low income kids has you know, reached alarming proportions. And there's a reason these investments are taking place, it's because they make a difference. These investments in enrichment opportunities support academic growth and, and uh, uh, the, the normal development of young people. So it's, I think, something we need to be very careful about when we look at what's going on during the school day. We also have to think about that non-school environment. So that's you know, where we're focused at. We think Nebraska's solution can be a huge contribution to this national discussion. We think we, we soar with our strengths in Nebraska, and our strength is high quality public schools. But what we're proposing is that school-based and school-linked out-of-school time programs, which are taking place across the state. This is nothing new. They're certainly taking place across the state. A number of you have visited these programs and know, and know what I'm talking about, uh, can be a, a great kind of mechanism for AQUEST to really develop those rich community partnerships that we know are important for kids to succeed. And it's not just us. Fortunately, there's a growing body of research that says when young people regularly participate in these kinds of pro programs, you see success in the A, Bs, and Cs. Attendance goes up, positive behaviors improve, and ultimately coursework and credits improve. So it's a proven strategy we think supports the great work that's going on in Nebraska schools. 
and again, focusing on that, that element of the population that we're really troubled with in terms of academic performance, low-income youth. When low-income youth regularly participate in high-quality expanded learning opportunity programs, research shows that some of these gaps uh, that we've been kind of plagued with over years in terms of a academic achievement can be eliminated. This shows a, a process of five years in participating in an after-school program focused on math uh, eliminates the math achievement gap by fifth grade. Wow. Yeah. Uh, we really feel like the data for this, this, uh, this work is kind of reaching a new level, uh, kind of similar to where our early childhood uh, 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 partners have kind of been moving the ball forward in terms of research around the impact of quality early childhood experiences. Um, and you know, they've distilled from that research these principles of quality. Very glad to note that these principles of quality are very similar to the principles of quality that this board approved back in 2013. So we're moving in the right direction. We think we have a really solid foundation to continue uh, progress and really think with AQUEST, we have an opportunity to kind of regalvanize our efforts in support of the, the principles that you guys have laid out and I think are really starting some interesting conversations around the state. So uh, just in sum, you know, we feel like in Nebraska we've got a great education system. And again, we feel very fortunate for the work that you guys have done as a board, previous boards have done, investments that communities across the state have made. I'm not a Nebraska resident. I feel blessed to be here because I've seen what other public school systems are like in other states. They're not the same quality as we have here. We've seen a lot of fragmentation away from support for systems of education and really commend you guys for developing a system-wide approach which provides quality opportunities for kids who may not have the opportunity to, to make that choice themselves. They're guaranteed a quality education in Nebraska. And we think that AQUEST is gonna continue that push and create incentives for more schools to reach out to their community partners and provide additional supports. And we are uh, ready and excited about the opportunity to collaborate with this with you on this, as well as some of our other partners, the Nebraska Association of School Boards, a group that we do a lot of work with. We're looking forward to working with them. Uh, Extension, 4-H Extension, huge partner across the state doing expanded learning work. And uh, very excited about continuing our partnership with them and a host of other groups and communities across the state. And again, appreciate you guys doing this hard work to develop a system like AQUEST the accountability framework that really does create opportunities for all of us who care about education in Nebraska and care about education for every student to get more actively involved. So that's you know, just kind of a quick overview, but uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions anybody has. I think Pat had a question. Well, a question and a comment. Um, Jeff, how long, have, how long has the, uh, Nebraska children been working with this? Uh, Nebraska Children Families has been working in the out-of-school time world for about 10 years now. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, and I, I think you've got such a, a marvelous base of uh, data collected. And I, I, back in the day when I actually worked for a living, uh, <laughs> we, I worked with Jeff. Uh, and he's right. They have wonderful, wonderful relationships with 4-H and with other entities. Or these programs wouldn't work. This is the true example of what the community engagement can be. And I applaud you for that, and, and I'm, I really appreciate your willingness to. Because I think as we go through these uh, EBA things mm -hmm. from year to year, this is gonna give mm -hmm. those schools an opportunity uh, in expanded learning and in access and all of those things that you're talking about in the tenants that will help them move from good to great to Excellent. So thanks, Jeff. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because the EBA, I do think, is really, it creates a, a platform for us now to say, look, we can help you uh, mm -hmm. move forward in these six areas by showing, you know, some, some successes. And, and I would just uh, applaud you guys and the work that the, the state has done in administering the 21st Century Community Learning Center grant program. That has been the bedrock for all the okay. expanded learning work that's happened across the state and you've done a wonderful job administering that program and really spreading it out both to urban and rural areas. So that is really the key building block. And just a quick report out that the uh, state legislator last year for the first time passed a grant program um, that identifies expanded learning programs as, a, as a, the sole focus point and identified some lottery dollars to help support that. So for the first time, 
uh, Nebraska legislature has identified this as an area that they're investing in. Uh, Lily, and then Molly, and then Glenn. <clears throat> Your 18% number yeah. of how much of a school day is uh, takes up those school. There we go. Uh, would there be a need to look at year-round schooling? Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, have you looked at that nationally I know we tried it in Lincoln it right. was very well received but it's a funding issue it's too funding, yeah but uh, have you ever thought of promoting that have some states done that right. and what were the results right yeah we have we've 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 looked at that and and you know I think when you look at those numbers it's it's hard to argue against the need for more dosage uh, you know mm -hmm. it, there's a lot of political reasons that have caused that to be problematic uh, you know a lot of middle-class families don't like the notion of their kids not being able to join in summer vacations right. a lot of rural areas mm -hmm. depending upon youth labor don't like the idea mm -hmm. of young people working during during those summer months um, but fundamentally I think it's a funding issue I mean the the cost that some states some states have, have moved more aggressively actually in the last round of budget cuts some states moved back to four-day schools which is something I pray Nebraska never oh. considers uh, but it is it's a primarily a, a, a major funding funding issue mm -hmm. um, what we feel like though is that the the current dosage of school in Nebraska seems to be pretty good and that what's missing oftentimes, especially in today's society, are opportunities for hands-on engaged learning out in the community. Uh, opportunities for kids to get their hands dirty, get some experience out in a first job or job shadowing, mm -hmm. interning, those kinds of things. Um, so I think there's an opportunity to think about, well, how do we build on this really solid base that we have in Nebraska mm -hmm. and create more learning opportunities as opposed to more schooling opportunities? Well. So, we know from the career committee that those are the sort of things that we can work on yes. and to expand those opportunities for students. But we do have year-round school yeah. for students who are in special needs. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they just have found it's crucial for them to retain the um, gains that they make in instruction. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and we do have summer school programs for yeah. that reason, too. So in some ways, we do have some forms of year-round exactly. school. Exactly. No, I think, yeah, I think if you looked at what's going on in a lot of buildings around the, around the state, there is a, you know, there's, there's mm -hmm. learning going on year-round. So, but yeah. I do think that we can, for students who don't fall into those classifications, we can really push for opportunities for them over the summer months to enhance their education. So thank you for your work. Well, Jeff, it's always a pleasure to hear you speak. And I've, I've kind of, the last five years, heard a lot of what you're doing. And North Platte had one of right. the 21st century right. learning grants when I was on the local board. The Kids Club really made an impact. But I have a question that is a bracket question. Okay. When we looked at that chart, and, and as Lily referenced, 18% of the times in school, right. did you notice that after graduation, the learning opportunities for adults is very minimal? Yeah. Lifelong learning seems right. to somewhat stop. Right. And um, the bracket question is this. We know that our students that are eligible for free and reduced lunch have parents that love them but may not have the time to do these enriching activities. So the bracket question is, with children and family, are you doing any expanded learning opportunities for the parents of these children mm -hmm. um, that are eligible for free and reduced lunch? Mm -hmm. I know at Liberty School, mm -hmm. um, our State Teacher of the Year um, talked about how they actually have classes for the parents of the children, and that seems to inherently help the expanded right. learning opportunities. Right. right. So have you thought yeah, of it's that? A, I think it's a great question and, and, and as you, you know, rightfully noted that the, that learning opportunity really yeah. gets narrow across the, the older yeah. lifespan and you know you've got the, the challenges of balancing work and family yeah. and all those and other learning. things that makes yeah. it really really hard. But no there's a lot and again I would argue that after school and summer programs create a great platform for engaging parents because those those blocks of time are more closely aligned with the parents work day mm -hmm. so I know here in Lincoln for example they've embraced what they call a full-service community school model 
where there are opportunities for parents to come in and take classes in a, a public school building during the non-school hours uh, that help build that community capacity. There are housing groups that offer first-time home ownership classes mm -hmm. in a, a neighborhood school. Um, so it's, a, it's another level uh, of kind of layering on additional supports to that infrastructure that in my opinion is Nebraska's best investment we've ever made of public dollars is high quality public schools in every community in our state and often in low income communities that is the best investment without really a close second I and mean, the public school is the the center of that community so I completely agree with the idea of layering on additional resources that can provide parents with those learning opportunities the challenge is the parents time well and and, and also there's that very basic need of human capital and with those adults if they don't get further education oftentimes they um, may become on entitlements right. because they don't have the skills to actually be employable. Right. And I know that we're K-12 education, sure. but <laughs> I think support, bracketing support for the parents is wonderful. And I will be asking Lily more about Lincoln's full service community mm -hmm. centers. I think mm -hmm. that might be a model mm -hmm. I would like to see you be promoting. And maybe that inherently will help our rural communities keep people employed and build their communities. Well, workforce. We, Nebraska Children is a, an active supporter of that work in Lincoln, and, and one mm -hmm. of the areas that we have supported is additional mental health services uh, because we realize there is a glaring gap in uh, access to high quality mental health services, especially low income kids. And uh, so that's another example yeah. of an additional layer. I mean, we really believe in the whole child whole concept, child. and there's so many uh, opportunities mm -hmm. we think to utilize the, the, the the trust that our communities rightfully have in, in public schools to provide those additional supports that ultimately will make a difference in that child's academic performance. I mean, ultimately, and that's civic what engagement, and civic too. engagement, yeah. and sense of involvement in the community. Um, so it's it's a it, some people may say that's mission creep in terms of the ta types of activity, but ultimately, I think research proves out that. Um, those kinds of interventions make a difference in the academic achievement of the children who's, who they see their parents getting involved academically as well. I was just wondering if we could get a copy of the slides sure. attached to the agenda. Yeah, yeah, I can. Uh, it's on a Prezi system, and obviously I'm not a master of it yet, but we can, we can uh, make those available. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. John? Yeah, Jeff, I'd like to commend you also for a lot of your work with the local school associations or foundations in our local areas. Right. They've just, you've really, if you will, uh, helped them a lot in regards to their direction and their support. And lastly, I got a quick question for you. Are you associated or work with the MMP, the Midlands Mentoring Partnership? Not directly. The foundation mm -hmm. is, uh, but my work's not directly. Okay. Related. I'm a teammate. Uh, I like uh, that. Teammate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Jeff, thank you so much. No, thank and you thanks much for, for I know we got delayed here on no, no, getting no. in the schedule, but thank you so much for being here today. Great. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Appreciate Have a great day. Happy New Year. <laughs> okay, um, we had no hearings for item five. There's, I don't <coughs> believe, a need for executive session for item six. So we'll move on to uh, item seven. Uh, which is action items and our first action item is to approve the amendment of the employment agreement for the Commissioner of Education. Lily? Uh, I'd like to move that the board hire FSG, no. we're on the item one, Excuse approve me. amendment to the employment agreement of the Commissioner of Education. Oh, I'm sorry. That's I right. thought we were up to the no. other. Okay. I move oh. we approve the amendment to the employment agreement for the Commissioner of Education. I'll second I that. second. We got Maureen was, I saw okay. her hand going first. So we have a motion and a second uh, to approve the amendment to the employment agreement for the Commissioner of Education. Any comments or discussion? Pat? Uh, I'd just uh, like to note that I, I think this uh, provides additional transparency in the Commissioner's contract. Uh, you know, we've seen situations in some parts of the state where all of a sudden boards wake up and find out they have huge liabilities or they don't know what's in the contract. Uh, I think it's very clear exactly what we're paying the commissioner for the job that he does, and there's nothing hidden there. 
and I, I think uh, that uh, just uh, makes uh, this whole process much more transparent and, and, and frankly um, uh, limits anybody's question about, you know, anything that the board may be doing. It's very clear that the contract is exactly what your remuneration is and there's nothing hidden in there. So I think this was a real improvement. Molly? Matt Bloomstead. <laughs> I just want to thank you so much for your leadership and empowerment, not just of the state board, but of your NDE staff. And under your leadership, I've really seen a coalescence of, of not just the department and the board, but our, but our partnerships across the state. And you bring so many talents. Um, this amendment to the employment agreement reflects our full hearted support of, of you. So thank you for serving as our commissioner. Any other questions or comments? And I think as we all would echo Molly's sentiments, so um, thank you for a great year. And uh, we are excited about where we are with the employment agreement and ready to move forward by a roll call. So Denise, please call the roll. John Witzel? Yes. Lily Larson? Yes. Glenn Flint? Yes. Rachel Wise? Yes. Molly O'Halloran? Yes. Patricia Tim? Yes. Maureen Nichols? Yes. Patrick McPherson? Yes. Eight yes. All right, thank you. Next we'll move on to item two. Uh, grant the commission authority to contract with, I can't get this, Agape, <laughs> Agape Red, Agape Red yeah. uh, develop the ATP caseload. So good morning, Mark. Good morning. I'm Mark Schultz, the director of Nebraska VR, and I'm here to ask that you grant the commissioner the authority to contract with Agape Red uh, to develop a replacement caseload tracking system for the Assistive Technology Partnership. So I'd be glad to answer any questions. Make the motion. <coughs> second. So we have a motion and a second by Pat. Tim, any questions or discussion? I, I just think um, it's kind of interesting. You talked about the agape red, but agape means brotherly love. And what you do in your business really does reflect that. And updating the tracking system is going to be amazing and keep us on the forefront of what you do. So I'm Thank fully you. in support. Thank you. If there's no other, Denise, please call the roll. Maureen Nichols. Yes. Patrick McPherson. Yes. Molly O'Halloran. Yes. Patricia Tim. Yes. Lily Larson. Yes. John Whistle. Yes. Rachel Wise. Yes. Glenn Flint. Yes. Eight yes. All right. Next, we'll move on to item three. Authorize the commissioner to negotiate a contract for strategic planning. Thank you. I move that we authorize the commissioner to negotiate a contract for strategic planning with FSG. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, let's move to discussion. Let's have discussion comments. Maybe there aren't any. Okay. <laughs> All right. I thought then we had a good we'll discussion yesterday. I guess we'll move to roll call. Denise? Sure I had it right. Rachel Wise? Yes. Glenn Flint? Yes. Lily Larson? Yes. John Witzel? Yes. Patrick McPherson? Yes. Maureen Nichols? Yes. Patricia Tim? Yes. Molly O'Holler? Yes. Eight yes. All right. Next we'll move on to item eight, which is the approval of consent agenda. <coughs> Glenn? I just wanted to ask about oh. item 8.5A, which is the Teach Early Childhood at Nebraska Scholarship Program. What's that all about? And is there anybody that can? So the do you, do you, uh, I, can, I can try to respond a little bit, actually, because I am familiar with it. It's been a program for quite a few years that provides scholarships to individuals who are looking at moving into uh, becoming a certified teacher in early childhood education and I think in the <coughs> document I have to go back to remember how much this year but there's a process where individuals apply for those scholarship opportunities and so it helps individuals to move into that field of education and teaching <coughs> I believe uh, is really uh, what the teach scholarships uh, are about and the programs have been about move for approval oh. I guess um, we haven't had this guy I move for approval of the yeah, consent agenda um, so we have move uh, approval for the consent agenda. Do we have a second? Second. So we have a second. 
Uh, so we have a motion and a second. We were having the discussion, thank you, on uh, item five, uh, which was the Teach Earlyhood Child, Childhood Nebraska Scholarship Programs. Is arrived. there any more additional more. information in Molly? I just wanted to say it is a scholarship program for low-income professionals working in early childhood education and care programs who want to continue education. And in our early childhood, com early childhood committee, we really wanted to beef up quality certified um, teachers. And I think it's awesome for, to have the scholarship program. Is this a new program or is something we just do? <laughs> Actually, we can bring Melody forward. Well, we have an that's, expert. That's, that's where you know the <laughs> deep better. expertise will yes. come into it. So. Um, I'm Melody Hobson, Administrator of the Office of Early Childhood. Now, TEACH has been um, in Nebraska for probably 15 years. And um, we have actually two different pots of TEACH money right now. One is, is from Step Up to Quality at State Money. <coughs> what, this grant actually is federal dollars coming through the CCDF program that we've granted out. But um, TEACH is, like, like Molly said, it is for um, people. I think right now the, the cap is $15 an hour to be eligible for a TEACH scholarship. And unfortunately, that does not um, exclude very many people in child care. <laughs> so, but, it, but what it does it is you have to be working about thir at least 30 hours a week in an early childhood program and um, working on um, working towards first towards an associate degree and then if you want to continue on towards a bachelor's degree with a teaching certificate and it's an, it, the, the one that we approve is the inclusive teaching certificate so that people can um, teach um, and have the knowledge to, to teach children with disabilities and children in multicultural um, from different backgrounds and um, I, I didn't have time to bring any of the stuff, but traditionally, we have been, it has been more effective at getting um, well qualified providers who actually match the community in which they teach, uh, because these are all non traditional students. Um, some of them they're kind of lured in by saying, you know, just take a class or two, and there's a lot of support for them through the the teach administration program. Um, everybody's pretty much in the same, but a lot of people who maybe have been out of school for a while, had never started college before, and they have a lot of concerns. They really work with them to keep them engaged. Uh, the, um, every, every year they do, um, they, they survey all of the, the, the teach participants, and it's, it's a little bit like a Hallmark movie because the, the, the people are so incredibly grateful because they would not necessarily qualify for any other scholarship but this pays for books, it helps with, with, um, with some release time and tuition, and um, then in turn, the, the participant agrees to stay in that um, environment for a period of time, so that cuts down on the, the turnover and the churn that we see so often in childcare. So. Okay, any other questions or comments? Thank you, Melody, so much. If not, Denise, call the roll. <clears throat> Molly O'Halloran? Yes. John Witzel? Yes. Lily Larson? Yes. Glenn Plint? Yes. Rachel Wise? Yes. Patricia Tim? Yes. Maureen Nichols? Yes. Patrick McPherson? Yes. Eight yes. Thank you. Next we move on uh, to item 10. And uh, under that we uh, have our first discussion around meeting participation. And since yesterday, we've had um, Lily Larson has um, indicated she's attending um, a Freedom Breakfast in Lincoln, Nebraska on January 18th. And Pat McPherson is planning to attend the Nebraska Association of Gifted Conference um, in um, February of 2016. I believe those are the additional updates that I have. Well, and I also said yesterday that I was going to the lunch. Okay, the that's right. We didn't get that on the list luncheon okay so we'll add that on the list any other uh, items if not is there a motion to approve the meeting participation so moved second we have a motion and a second any discussion yes ma'am um, once again and I'll, I, I note from the from what's going to follow the year-to-date expense uh, expenses for board members 
there we're well on our way to spending more than $7,200 a year per board member on travel. I think that's outrageous. And uh, to make it, make it easy for Denise, I'll refer to my, uh, and for the record, my comments are the same as they were last month. <laughs> they are the same as they were last month. Uh, and those are, this board needs a travel expense policy that among other things, one, defines appropriate functions that board members may attend at NDE expense. Two, that defines the limits, uh, that defines or limits amounts that board members may, may expend, expense on an annual basis. Three, that defines appropriate levels of reimbursement for meals, mileage, lodging, registration, et cetera. Four, that defines the difference between board functions that are reimbursable by the state and constituent and non-official functions that should be paid for by the member personally or by his or her campaign account. Any other comments? If not, Denise, please call the roll. I believe Pat made the motion and Lily had the second. John Witzel? Yes. Lily Larson? Yes. Glenn Flint? Yes, I'm approving Pat's travel. <laughs> it's <Ray> very minimal. <laughs> Rachel Wise? Yes. Patrick McPherson? No. Maureen Nichols? Yes. Patricia Tim? Yes. Molly O'Halloran? Yes. Seven yes, one no. Okay. <coughs> All right. Uh, next item is the information that you have in front of you is on the monthly board travel expense report uh, and that is for your information. I well, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I've often thought these last five years that um, it's really an honor and a privilege to serve on the board and it is a, an expense not just in our time <coughs> but also um, in gas and food when we do travel. Many of us are able to pay our own way, but I would hate this to become a board where only people of a certain level of affluence could actually represent their districts. And, um, and during my tenure, there have been times when there are some people that can't afford even to pay for it up front and be reimbursed. So I really do want to make sure that we as a board um, I think Pat's comments are very on target about to make sure what we're doing is in compliance with our roles as State Board of Education members. <coughs> but and when I look at where you're going and when I see you at these meetings, I know you're there not just to get a free meal or, or a trip to Lexington or wherever we are, um, but that you're really there to build those partnerships that will increase our ability to create policies that affect change for student achievement. <coughs> and I am very much also aware that I am the one that lives farthest away. And um, uh, believe me, when I'm traveling three and a half, four and a half hours, I realize that is an expense uh, that is being reimbursed. And I do want to thank the state for lowering the reimbursement level because gas is less expensive now. So I do want you to know, just from my viewpoint, I try to be very careful about what I choose <coughs> to attend. And when I do go, I do go to all the meetings, and I listen, and I try to bring the message back to our group. <coughs> but uh, you know, I do appreciate your comments that we need to be very careful of taxpayer money and not spend it indiscriminately. <coughs> Thank you. OK, any other? <coughs> comments um, if not we'll move on to item 11 and that's the information reports that that you have in front of you and as we move to item 12 again I just want to reiterate that I will send out an email um, in the next couple of days that will identify the committees uh, for next year and and ask you to be thinking about what committees that you want to be involved in and respond back and we'll put together that information and share and have that discussion in our January meeting. Our January 25th meeting is tentatively set to start at either 1030 or 11. We're still working through that time frame based on how much work Brian puts together for us. Uh, and um, 
you know, then it will be a full day going in with the reception that evening that starts at 5. Madam President, I, yeah. I think you missed, uh, I, I see that under 11.3 there was a state board policy on a member's expenses. Were you going to talk about that? Uh, typically under item 11 is information items that we don't discuss, but we certainly can. So if you want to discuss, we don't do action on these items. They're there for written reports if there is any discussion. So typically on, a, on item 11, they're for your review. They're on the agenda, but we usually don't talk about them unless someone wants to bring one up. So well, if you want to talk about it, it to me that's great. That, uh, it's there for approval of the board, is the way I originally read it. And, and if that's the case, I don't believe <coughs> that it should be approved. <coughs> uh, and if that, I just, what, what is the reason it's there? Uh, item 11 is really information items. We're not acting. Item 11 is there. Um, yeah, Lily, I'll let you. I thought that it was important for board members to know which policies would be presented to the policy committee <coughs> at the next month. It was never done before. And so it, what it does, it, the information comes out to you. So you can look at it ahead of time. I didn't think it was good for just a few members of the board to know what was being talked about in so it's meant to keep you up to speed so you know what committees are doing or at least policy was doing and do you not want that is that what you're no, telling I, I, me I just guess I did not understand why it was there if it's there for informational reasons to tell us that we're going to be dealing with it next month that's fine and yeah, every I will, month, I will let you know that if there is if there is not a substantial rewrite of that policy, I will vote to table it until such time there is. If that is brought to this board next month, two two things. I'm going to have Margaret speak, but keep in mind we will be changing committee structures and having that discussion um, between now and January. So again, we are in a transition time period. Um, as we reorganize committees and talk about that committee structure as as well so I just wanted to keep that on the forefront I would like to Mark still comment this has been going on every month there's been a listing of the policy this is not something that just showed up maybe you just didn't notice it well, before perhaps I didn't notice it and I apologize if <laughs> I didn't but it's obviously an issue that concerns me yeah well Under and believe me I know that uh, and yet at the same time, I like transparency. And this is one example of transparency. So to think that policy has never recognized a concern, I beg to differ. So, um, so. commissioners just asked to make a comment and then I believe yeah, and I'll have Margaret. Go well, what I'll try to, yeah, yeah, so I, I think as we've talked about this, it is, it's, um, regular part of the process to review the, with the board. So we actually, it's a, it's actually a good point to kind of go, ah, that's why we put those reports there. In this case, it just so happens, it just so happens that this is one of the policies up for review and timely as it may be <laughs> for the conversation's yeah. sake. Um, so it will be coming there. And as we shape the new committees, it's actually on the committee's agenda for work coming right up. And I don't know if Mark would add anything else to that. Yeah, the, the board has a policy on policies, of course, <laughs> and the policy on policies calls for a four-year review of every state board policy. Now, the, the policies such as the travel expense policy, um, that is the internal directives and the state board procedural rules, do not have a sunset date. So they are reviewed every four years, but not necessarily changed or reaffirmed, they are reviewed. The general education policies do have a sunset date and they will sunset every in four years after adoption or reaffirmation or revision unless they're reaffirm, reaffirmed or revised. Um, so that's just by way of background. Now this policy uh, 
is one of the ones that is up in the regular ROTA for four-year review. And the process the board adopted some years back uh, is, oh, is it on? It should be on. No, am I on? Uh, the policy that the board has adopted some years back calls for policies that are coming up for review to go on the board agenda as an information item and then that they be taken up by the policy committee. And the policy committee will come back uh, with recommendations if the committee feels that the policy should be revised. That is not to say that any member of the state board can bring forward a policy at any time and propose uh, propose on his or her own behalf revisions. So I, I believe that the policy should have a cover memo with it which addresses that procedure, but maybe it got left off this time. I'm not sure, I shut down my computer. Yeah. Um, it's very general, so maybe we can work on that. Like sure, so. sure, we can give you more background. And I, I, and I do think this also brings up another point that 11 is there for information items that you review, but we always can talk about those items that are in 11. So, you know, I may go over that too quickly, but 11 is not action, it's just information items. And at any time, that if there's items we need to discuss that are there in those written reports, certainly uh, something we should do. Glenn? I may not be the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I think Pat is angling for a position on the policy. <laughs> <laughs> That's certainly his prerogative to make that re request to be on that committee. <laughs> All right, any other, any other discussion around the information items in 11? All right, now we'll move to item 12. Uh, and again, thank you everybody um, for all that you do. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to serve with all of you and certainly uh, to serve in a leadership capacity. So with that, we will move to adjourn adjournment and our next uh, meeting will be the legislative retreat, which will be Monday, January 25th. And um, originally we thought that it would be around 9 a.m., but probably not, probably 10.30 or 11. We'll get that time out to you in the next couple of days that verifies that time frame. The work session will be held on Thursday, February 4th at 2 p.m. and a board meeting will be held on Friday, February 5th, 2016 at 9 a.m. in this room. Since we have not established our committee, all of our committees and committee structure, uh, we will also let you know what committee meetings will be held in February and when. There is a possibility you may wanna block the Wednesday out a little bit because there may be a need for either a strategic planning committee to meet that afternoon and or legislative. So there's some unknowns about that, but you might wanna just kinda keep Wednesday afternoon in mind for some uh, committees might need to meet. Mm -hmm. Molly? One clarification, so we're meeting at 10.30 on the 25th all day till the five o'clock after hours. Do we know where that's going to be? Um, right over at the receptions at the Cornhusker. Uh, the receptions at the Cornhusker, but the meeting, yeah. Right, the meeting will probably be here as opposed to the, It'll be here. Uh, we've yeah. done it before over there too. So the legislative retreat will be held here at the department and the reception will be at the Cornhusker. Probably five to seven or something. Yes, around that yeah. time period. And we'll probably end between four and 4.30. Um, so we'll end in ample time to transition over there. All right, I think that um, uh, would it be advisable to turn back all the information we may still hold about the uh, vendors? Yeah, you can return that to Dublin. Uh, actually, yeah, that's just a good reminder that if you have information that you've written on, any kind of notes that you've taken, um, feel free to bring those in and, and work through the uh, material destroy process. Records retention. It, what is it called again? The records retention. Record, records retention procedures, which in <coughs> essence will destroy those materials. So do make sure that you periodically uh, bring things in to have those appropriately um, identified and destroyed. And I think these materials would be part of if you made notes on those kinds of things and stuff. So, yep. all right, good question. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. I might spend the night.